Today's goal is to define postmodernism. Unfortunately, since it isn't anything, we can't really define it. Nonetheless, we're going to try. So postmodernism is a term that encompasses a wide range of developments in philosophy, film, architecture, art, literature, culture. You'll see it everywhere in the world. And originally it was a reaction to modernism, which referred to the lack of artistic, intellectual, or cultural thought of organized principle. So you'll find when you study postmodernism, it can be intensely frustrating because it seems very chaotic, it seems very disordered. It started around the 1940s, but like any period, we don't know exactly a particular date or there wasn't one particular piece of work. We just began to observe patterns of people producing art and literature and culture that seem to reflect the same kinds of structures and thoughts and narratives. So this peaked around the 1960s and 70s with the release of Catch-22 and Slaughterhouse-Five by Kurt Vonnegut Jr. Postmodernism um, is very difficult to study in a linear way, uh, so I've attached a handout that you can work through and it will frustrate you to no end because none of it bears any semblance to reality so um, just bear with me uh, so first of all what is postmodernism well, well we'll try to to tag a basic description on it's used to describe different components of post-world war ii literature or after modernist literature and there's not a clear and defined definition of, of it because there's very little agreement of the concepts and characteristics and ideas with postmodernism However, for the purposes of today's lecture, we're going to look at what characteristics people do agree on. It contains a broad range of concepts and ideas that include responses to modernism, responses to technology, greater diversity of cultures, which also leads to greater cultural pluralism, and reconceptualizations of society and history from different perspectives. So modern literature, by contrast, um, there, there are a few similarities, but like modernist literature, both are told from an objective or omniscient point of view. Both literatures explore the external reality to examine the inner states of consciousness and of the characters, and both employ fragmentation and narrative and character construction. This is more true in postmodernism than it is in modernism. So Joseph Heller uh, was one of the preeminent authors of, um, he wrote Catch-22 of postmodern literature. Uh, we've got Thomas Pynchon, and you may not recognize his work, but you've probably heard his name. Kurt Vonnegut, my favorite, uh, Slaughter has five breakfasts of champions, and he uses pastiche in his writing. We'll get to those features later. Tim O'Brien is another example, and he wrote The Things They Carried. So postmodernism, all truth is relative, except this statement. So let's get into the features. The first feature we'll discuss is irony, playfulness, and black humor. You'll see this in Pynchon's writing, uh, wordplay, uh, while discussing serious objects. An example of this can be found in the names of his characters, like Mike Fallopian. Pastiche is also found in the postmodern genre. Uh, pastiche is blending of influences from various um, places and combining, recombining those in a familiar form. Metafiction is when you write about writing. So this is often used to undermine the authority of the author and to advance the stories in unique ways. So for example, in Italio, Italo Calvino's novel On a Winter's Night, A Traveler, it's about a reader attempting to read a novel by the same name. And in Kurt Vonnegut Jr.'s um, novel Slaughterhouse-Five, the first chapter is about the process of writing. The next feature we'll look at is paranoia. Paranoia is the belief that there's something out of the ordinary while everything remains the same. Often this could be the sense that the government is watching you at all times. So in Kurt Vonnegut Jr.'s novel Breakfast of Champions, there's a character who becomes violent when he imagines that everyone else is a robot and he is the only human left. Intertextuality is an important element of postmodernism because it acknowledges that previous works have been part of the influence on the present work. So there is a dependence on literature from earlier attempts to, cr to comment on a particular situation, and often in postmodernism, the commentary in the new text will reflect directly back to a previous text. Magic realism. 
we've seen this in Chronicle of a Death Foretold, and this is um, arguably the most important postmodern technique. Uh, Latin American literature is rife with this. It's the introduction of fantastic or impossible elements into a narrative that's otherwise very normal. So an example of this would be um, an angel falling from heaven and landing on earth in a mud puddle and getting her wings dirty. So it, it's the abnormal inclusion of the angel with the very normal treatment of her wings getting dirty. So magic realist novels may include dreams taking place during normal life or the return to previously deceased characters. Often they have extremely complicated plots with wild shifts in time. Myths and fairy tales become part of the narrative. Many critics argue that magic realism has its roots in Borges and Marquez, two South American writers. And some have classified it as a Latin American style. Simulacra. Simulacra are copies that depict things that either had no reality to begin with or that no longer have an original. So in this famous um, painting, uh, Assassine, Pause and Peep, um, the idea expressed is that this, this isn't a pipe because this is a, a picture of a pipe and in the form you're looking at it, it's actually a digital representation of a picture of a pipe. And so we see that the original idea of the pipe is very separate from the, in, the idea that we internalize when we look at this painting. That was by Gauguin. Uh, faction is our next concept. This is very similar to historiographic metafiction uh, in that its subject material is based on actual events, but writers have um, writers of faction tend to blur the line between fact and fiction to the degree that it's almost impossible to know the difference between the two. And this is different from metafiction, which often very purposefully draws attention to the fact that it's not true. Temporal distortion. This is a literary technique that uses non-linear timelines, so events are told out of place. The author jumps forwards or backwards in time, or there may be cultural and historical references that don't fit. Abraham Lincoln uses a telephone in Ishmael Reed's Flight to Canada. This technique is frequently used in literature, but it has become even more so in films. The problem with postmodernism is that there isn't any one singular narrative or meaning that you can create. There are multiple answers, multiple interpretations. Think back to the videos uh, MTV began to create in the 1980s on Much Music where um, you could in throw together a wide variety of possible subjects, ideas, thoughts, clips, and the end result would be completely different depending on who's watching it and how they, they react to those images. We have meta-narrative as another feature. Jean-Francois Lyotard came up with this, and this is just a narrative about narratives. So it's uh, the, a story within a story. Stephen King is very well known for doing this type of thing. Fragmented narratives um, often are, have no sense of order or unity in the work. They're completely broken up. It isn't usually until the end of the narrative that we realize how the pieces all fit together. Participation. So many postmodern authors, as a response to modernism, which frequently sets its authors apart from the readers, um, in postmodernism, the writer attempts to involve the reader as much as possible over the course of the novel. And this can take the form of asking the reader questions, including unwritten narratives that must be constructed by the reader, or allowing the reader to make decisions regarding the course of the narrative. This is different from a choose-your-own-adventure novel, where we actually do have a choice in what happens in this it's often rhetorical questions that are asked or the the writer comes out of the writing in order to uh, involve us more directly Technoculture and hyper-reality become very important as well. This tends to be one of the, the foci of this type of writing. Uh, Frederick Jameson called it uh, the cultural logic of late capitalism. But according to his logic, society has moved beyond capitalism and into an age, an information age, in which we're constantly bombarded with ads, videos, product placement. And so you'll often see a lot of references to this, you know, a futuristic um, Japanese landscape with billboards and neon signs, that's sort of thing. Uh, so many postmodern authors reflect this in their work by inventing products that mirror actual advertisements or by placing their characters in situations in which they cannot escape from technology. So one of the themes which you generally do not see as, as prevalent um, is the inclusion of nature as um, a necessary part of our lives. So uh, postmodernism is very different from, say, romanticism. 
We'll move on to historiographic metafiction. This was a term created by Linda Hutchin, and it's re this refers to novels that fictional fictionalize actual historical events and characters. So Thomas Pynchon's Mason and Dixon, for example, features a scene in which George Washington is smoking weed. One feeling that characters often experience throughout postmodern texts is a sense of isolation and alienation. And you'll see that characters are often very separate from one another. One another. I'm reminded of the film Blade Runner. So you can see how all these different features make it very difficult to define what postmodernism is. If you take a look at this wordle, you'll see that, that it really is a collective of multiple different thoughts and a coming together of many different um, points of thinking. So when you think about postmodernism, just remember that um, meaning can change depending on who's reading it, and the interaction between the reader and the writing is absolutely essential. Some influential works that I've already mentioned that you may want to check out, Catch-22, Slaughterhouse-5, Lost in the Funhouse, The Things They Carried, White Noise, Gravity's Rainbow, and The Crying Lot of 49. You certainly won't have a full understanding of postmodernism now, but hopefully you're just a little bit closer to knowing what it is.